all the data in your app is either static or dynamic. If it's static, you literally just write in the value, hello, Alex, or change the font size to 24. Those are static values. But if it's dynamic, that's where this icon comes in. And you use this when you want the value to be based on something else, and it could come from anywhere. So it might come from an API call or from your database. It could come from the user, from one of the global properties we have, like their current time or whether they're on Android or not. It could come from a calculation, from a custom function or expression that you write. It really could come from anywhere. So in this video, we're going to look at data binding in Flutterflow. So first, which values can you bind? Well, when you drag a widget onto your canvas and you just scroll through, you can see that all over you'll have these icons and anywhere you have that icon, that can be a dynamically generated value. And we're constantly adding this icon to new properties so that you have more dynamic control over the widgets in your app. So probably by the time you watch this video, you will see more of these icons because we keep adding them to new properties. Okay, so how do you use these? Well, first, there are two types of bindings that you can make in Flutterflow. Bindings from a single value or multiple values. So let's look at those one at a time. So a single value is just where you click on one of these properties and you're binding it to whatever you need in here. Multiple values is when you have a source with a list of things coming in from an API or a backend call and you're generating widgets or values from each one of those items in the list. And that just takes one additional step before you do this kind of binding and we'll look at that in a second. So first, single values. Now, the first thing to note is that these are type aware and type safe. So up here, it's going to tell us what type of value it's expecting. So here it's expecting a string. And if you twirl open the properties down here, it's going to show you with these icons, the type of value that's down here and that's available to you. So this is a date time variable. This is a string. These are Booleans. And so it's not just type aware, but it's type safe, which means you can only bind values of the type that it's expecting. So I can only bind string values in here. Now you might look down at this list. It's like, well, wait a second. Here's a Boolean value down here, a true or false value. And it seems like I can bind it. And that's true. And that's just because under the hood, Flutterflow is running a little convenience function, a two string method, just so you don't have to run that conversion yourself. So let's grab a widget that expects a numerical value like an integer, and let's drop it in there. And when we go to initial count, we can see that the type it's expecting is an integer. So when we twirl open these global properties, you can see that all the values that aren't an integer are in this red and we can't click on them. So it's type safe. Okay, let's go back into our original text value right over here. And you've noticed we have this one bound already. So you can click into it. And when it's been bound, you are gonna see the options available with the bound property here. So we're given a default variable value and a value to display in the builder right here. And that's because if the dynamic value that you're binding requires some network request, maybe you're calling an API or you're running some sort of function, you're only going to see it in test mode. And if that's so, you're going to see this in brackets right here. That just means that you'll only be able to see this value when you do a test mode or run mode. But if you want to see the value, maybe for typesetting or just to see how it flows in your app, you can put a value in here. And when you confirm it, you'll see it in there. Now, let's come back in here. And so you're in the settings here and you have some important options up here. Now, if you wanna change the binding, so maybe you bound to the wrong thing, you can come into this pencil right here and it'll bring you back into that original screen. And of course, you can delete it or if you wanna accept the original one, you can just click out of there. You also have the ability to copy the variable. And when you copy that variable, you can click in here, let's edit it, and you're gonna see that paste value comes up here. And that'll be the same thing if you go into another binding, you can come up here and paste the value in there. Or if you do a nested binding, it'll occur in just the same spot as before. And this is another important point, is that your bindings can be nested. So let's cancel out of here for a second, and let's remove this binding right here. So let's look at some nested binding right here. So let's come in here 
And maybe we want to change the greeting based on whomever is logged in. So we can do a conditional value right here and set this condition right here. And so now we're one level deep right here. So we can check this condition. We can say if the authenticated user is equal to a specific value, we'll say Alex, then we want to say, hey, folks. And if not, we're just going to say hello to that person. So we can come in here and we'll do a combined text and say hello. And then we'll bind that to the authenticated user's display name. Beautiful. Now, there's two important points about nested bindings. First, you generally don't want to go through more than three levels of binding because it just becomes hard to follow. And there's probably a better way to design the logic if you're having to go through that many levels. For instance, you probably want to do whatever logical work you have to do before the data even gets there. And second, remember that the innermost binding will evaluate first. So that is to say, the order that these bindings will execute will start from the deepest level and then move out. So that means if you're having trouble figuring out how something is calculated, click into the deepest level of the binding, figure that value out, and then work your way up or out one level at a time. So that first one in here, then if I know that, then that value gets passed to here, then that value gets passed to here. That'll help you debug when there's something that goes wrong. Okay, great. Let's just confirm that and come back in here and take a look at some more things about this. Now, what's available to you in these sources will depend on what services and what features you have enabled in Flutterflow. So I have authentication set up right here, but if I remove authentication, then we won't see those variables available inside the sources. So this will be dynamically updated. So if you're not seeing something that you expect to, make sure that that service or feature is enabled. Next, let's quickly go through these values and just show you what do you have available to you on every binding. That is, whether you have any services enabled or not. First, you'll have page parameters. And you can find those if you select outside here in the canvas or just select here on your root widget. And you can set them up in these page parameters there. These are for if you're going to accept data on this page when the user navigates to there. So if you have any page parameters set up, that's where you'll find them. And you can bind them here. Next, you have a set of global variables. This is information about the user's device that could be helpful for you when you're designing your app, like the time and location, the link to the current page, and all these other options. Here, I have some state variables set up, but if you don't have those set up, you're not gonna see these here. But if you have them set up, they'll be available. Next up, we've got some helper functions we have available to you. So combine text like we saw before, if you need to concatenate, put a bunch of pieces of text together, some date time conversions, conditional logic. If you need to run any custom code, you can use these two right here. This code expression allows you to run short bits of code, just one expression that needs to be evaluated. But if you have multiple lines of code that you wrap up into a function, those will show up here. Next, we've got some random and sampled that's useful when you're designing your app, but you don't have your data from your backend or API yet. You can use these to fill up your app with data. So we have all the different types of data and sample data like names and images for like profiles. Here you've got Firebase Remote Config. Now you need to have this set up to see anything in here, but if you do, you'll see those. And finally, some constants, including the breakpoints that you set up in your theme settings. Okay, so that's data binding when you have a single value that you need to generate. Next, let's look at data binding when you have multiple values. That is, you'll have a list of data or JSON coming in from another service, and you need to display that or bind that in your app. Here's how you do it. Now, the last step is the same. That is, you will come into this text and bind it, but there's one step you have to do before then. So let's get out of here and let's remove this value. Let's get rid of our text right here. And the first thing that you're going to need is a widget that has has multiple children. And how do you know that? Well, you can figure that out just by looking at the icon or reading the words, it's fairly obvious. So rows, column, stack, grid view, staggered view, page view, list view. These are designed for multiple children. Unlike 
images or buttons, which are just single widgets. Okay, so I've already got a column on this page. So the next step is to link up this widget that has many children with a source. And most of the time, you're going to do it with this tab right here, a backend query. And so you want to add a backend query and then select what query type. Now, most of the time, you're going to use either query collection or an API call. So in query collection, this will be for Firebase queries. So if you're using Firebase as a backend, this is how you use it. And then you just select whichever collection you want to connect to. So maybe I want to display my users right here. So we can select that and we're given a bunch more options, but we'll cover that in our Firebase lesson. So we can just confirm that right now. Here, we're getting a pop-up that tells us that, hey, now that you're linked up with this column, all of the children in the column are going to be generated from the documents in this collection. That is, you can't manually add widgets into this column anymore. Or said another way, the widgets that we add into our column will be linked up with each item in the collection. And that's great, that's what we want. Okay, so that's the first step here. We've connected our column to a backend query. Now, the next step is to add in whatever widgets we want to display for each of the documents in our collection. Now, keep in mind that you can only have one child widget for each of the documents in the collection. Now, of course, you can have more children inside that one widget, but one top level widget. So let me show you. So I'm going to put a row in right here. And when you have a dynamically bound source from like a backend call, you're going to see this UI where you have one item in full opacity and then these grayed out ones. This is just indicating to you that these are dynamically generated values and you'll see them when you do a test or run mode. Okay, so maybe I want the image of a user. Let's shrink that down to say 60 pixels and get rid of the height. And then we'll want their name. So we just drop that in there. Okay, so now we have the structure, but we actually haven't done any of the data binding itself. We've connected to it to the source, but we haven't told the text to connect to any field in that document. So let's select our text here and open up our data binding and we see a new thing here. We see this users document and we're seeing this here because we've connected our column to our collection of users and we get this really nice UI here. So when we hover over it in orange, it will indicate to the user where this is coming from. We'll also see this in the widget tree. So first we'll see this little icon that says, oh, we're connected to this. And then also when we come up into this menu, when we highlight it, we get another highlight UI there. So that's just a helper. And then when we twirl this open, we can see all of the fields available to us to bind to. So maybe I want to bind to the user's email and display that, but I want to display their name. And then we just do the same with the image. So let's scroll down. We want to update the path of that image, and then we can see we have that photo URL available to us. So all we need to do is do a test mode in this, and we'll see all our users. Next, let's look at how to do this if we're doing an API call. It's almost the same except for one slight difference. So let me show you that. So I'm going to come into this column here and remove that backend query. So let's come into our backend query and we're going to bind to an API call. So let's open that up. And I've got this one called blog posts. Beautiful. Let's confirm that. And so same thing as before we are now connected to our column. But because the data we get back from an API can be much more diverse from the structure of the data coming back from Firebase, we have to take one more step. And so we come in over here to this generate dynamic children and we need to give it a name. Well, what are we giving a name to? Well, with Firebase, we had a very specific structure. So we have a collection with documents. Here, we're naming the equivalent of the document. So let's just give it a name. We'll call it posts. And where are we binding it to? We're binding it to that post response. And here we've got some options about what in the response do we want this bound to? Well, we'll cover these details in the video on APIs in Flutterflow, but let me show you the structure of the data so it makes more sense in how we're gonna bind this. So here's the data. We've got an array of objects and each object has a user ID, an ID, a title, and a body. Okay, so I'm just going to bind to that JSON body. Beautiful, confirm that. 
This just gives us the same message as before, and we're ready to do our bindings. So let's come over to our text and click in here. And now, same as before, we've got the post item. So let's select that. And here, we don't wanna just display that whole object. Let's just display the title. So we would have to go in here and say JSON path and bind it to the title property. Confirm. And we don't have any images, so let's just get rid of this. And let's just give us some room to breathe. Beautiful. Let's test it out and see what it looks like. Beautiful. All my posts. And that's how to bind data in Flutterflow.